All right, and we left off with this timeline of the Paleozoic. And I really want to stress the importance of understanding the, uh, the basic backdrop. We've got narratives going on through the Paleozoic. We've got uh, changes that are caused by um, moving continents. We've got plants that are moving up on the dry land. And there's some pretty substantial paleoclimatic shifts that are occurring. And in particular, we'll be thinking about the ones occurring during the Devonian and Carboniferous, basically leading into the Permian. And so uh, this is a time in which the vertebrates make their move onto dry land. And I want you to think pretty carefully about, well, what's going on during this time. Uh, if we look from the early Devonian through the later Devonian into the Carboniferous and finally over to the Permian, uh, we see a progression of climatic changes that are really really crazy. I mean, we've talked about how, how things were during the Carboniferous, how we had this drawdown of CO2, things got really cold and, uh, and drier as a result of that, and things dried out even further in the Permian. But this time, the early Devonian um, is kind of like where it all starts. I mean, uh, if you, looking at the fossil record, looking at the, at the uh, geological strata that we have in here, the early Devonian was characterized by a uh, warm, temperate seasonal flooding basically it was a really nice time to be a living organism right uh, things were warm actually things are considerably a lot warmer than they are today but the important feature here so we had um, seasonal flooding and we had the formation of gigantic inland seas uh, which were largely of lower salinity they weren't entirely fresh water but they're of a lower salinity than what you would have in the oceans and this kind of triggered um, the evolution of some of the characteristics we've already talked about, like true bone, as well as the origin of swim bladders, which eventually become the lungs in terrestrial vertebrates. And so in the early Devonian, we have these flooded continents, vast inland seas of high primary productivity. There's a lot to eat, and the vertebrates move in. Uh, vertebrates, in this case, I, I mean fish, because there aren't anything else. And through the Devonian, especially in the later portion of the Devonian, moving into the Carboniferous, uh, we've got uh, the CO2 drawdown. Things become cooler and drier, and these flooded continents go through longer and longer periods of dry seasons. And so in the late Devonian, we've got these longer dry seasons, and this is when the vertebrates move onto land. You could sort of say, okay, well, here's where we have the transition onto land of the tetrapodomorphs. Okay? And as things become even drier during the Carboniferous with that CO2 drawdown, we see the origin of amniote vertebrates. We talked about that before. With amniotes, we've got the ability to complete an entire life history without ever having to become aquatic. I call, I call amniotes the seed plants of the vertebrate world. They don't need to go back to their watery past. They can basically complete their whole life in dry land habitats. And so now what I want to superimpose onto this timeline of the Devonian through the Permian is that sequence of changes in the vertebrate lineage. And so in the early Devonian, we've got the osteichthyes taking their form uh, with their true bone and internal air sacs. And uh, one of the groups of the osteichthyes, the Sarcopterygii, the Sarcopterygii start making their move onto dry land during the Devonian. Well, various forms of amphibian-like things, uh, ichthyostega, tiktaalik, they're all occurring during the Devonian. And one of these tetrapodomorphs uh, comes up onto dry land and it is incredibly successful. Not only does it give rise to all of the modern amphibia, frogs, um, it also gives rise to the amnioto, which appear during the Carboniferous. Now, if you think about these early tetrapods, these early experiments with life on dry land, uh, these four-legged sarcopterygians would have had to have come up onto these dry land habitats, presumably during those longer dry seasons, during those periods in which we had extended drought. Uh, the water in the pond dried up, and they'd have to withstand a period of drought for some time before the water, the, the rains came back. And so, yeah, if you think about it, it would make sense for them to raise their babies during the rainy season, or at least during those periods of continental flooding, because that's when we had lots of food for the babies to eat. And then after a long period of growth, the babies were nice and big, that would be a good time for them to make their transition onto dry land. And that's kind of like what all modern amphibians do. They start off life uh, primarily as, as kind of like fishes, and then they crawl up onto dry land and metamorphose into sexually mature adults uh, when they've reached a certain size. Okay.
Now what we have in the case of the amniota is this feature called the amniote egg. You can sort of think of it as a private pond in which the embryonic amniote, this embryonic vertebrate, can complete the aquatic portion of its development so that it can hatch out as a completely terrestrial baby. So here's the baby, um, nice big old yolk sac from which it's uh, feeding and uh, there's a blood supply too that's providing the nutrition from the yolk sac to the baby. Um, all that development is happening inside of some type of uh, shell membrane. Then you might have albumin on the outside. But, uh, but the, uh, the, these layers, these layers of stuff that we have surrounding this aquatic world, basically all this is H2O base. We've got, we've, we've got that private pond inside of the egg and the outside of the egg is dry. Uh, it's either keratinized or like in the case of a chicken egg, it's, it's keratinized and calcified uh, so that it's hard on the outside. But we maintain the ability to have gas exchange occurring between the amnion and the outside world. You can have oxygen diffusing in, we have CO2 diffusing out. And so, uh, so what happens is that this little, this little lizard can complete its entire development inside its little capsule of water, its private pond that can be uh, maintained in, I mean, not necessarily a dry nest, you can sort of envision this happening initially kind of in the way that it does with crocodiles or turtles. You can, uh, crocodiles and turtles, they bury their eggs so that it's not entirely dry on the outside, but there's air, you can have gas exchange, you're not going to, you're not going to be at huge risk of drying out. Now there's some derived amniotes like the marsupials and the placental mammals that don't have, uh, that don't lay eggs. Monotremes like the duckbill platypus does lay eggs, but um, marsupials and placental mammals don't. But obviously they have some derived provisions to allow for the growth of their embryo under completely wet conditions until they're born. So this amniote egg, uh, a really remarkable innovation uh, for life on dry land. It appears for the first time during the, uh, the driest areas, the driest, coolest times of the Carboniferous, which kind of makes perfect sense. This would be a time when uh, these very uh, drought-adapted tetrapods uh, had very limited access to water. Uh, the, the rainy season had gotten so short that these animals were kind of forced into innovating and getting really creative in the formation of a private pond for the development of the babies seemed like a really good idea. Okay, so we're going to start with the amniote murca of the Carboniferous, and by the time we actually make the transition into the Permian, we're going to have two distinct lineages. One of which is going to be the synapsids, and the other one is the diapsids. And in some taxonomies, this, this diapsid group is referred to as the reptilomorpha. Now it's, uh, it's pretty easy when you look in Permian fossils of these amniotes to tell the difference between a synapsid and a diapsid. Okay? And, uh, and, and it has to deal with the number of holes you find in the skull, uh, in particular the holes behind the eye socket. So if here's like a typical skull, here's the teeth, and, uh, there's a lower jaw, I'm not going to draw the lower jaw in. So if this is the skull of an animal, here's the ocular orbit, ocular orbit, the eye socket. Okay? Behind the ocular orbit, there's a structure called the postorbital fenestra. I think it's with an E. I'd have to look that up. But the idea is, okay, well, first, post means after, so it's behind the orbit, it's behind the eye socket. And fenestra is the Latin word for window. And, and so what we're looking at here is an, an yet another hole into the skull. It's behind the eye socket. And this is used uh, largely for the attachment of jaw muscles and other things. And you know, there are holes and nooks and crannies and bones that allow for the attachment and insertion of muscles. And so in the synapsids, you've got one postorbital fenestra. And in the diapsids, you have two, right? So there's your ocular orbit, and you've got one postorbital fenestra in the temporal area, one in the supratemporal area. So you've got two postorbital fenestrae which is why we call them diapsids, right? So like an apse is the area at the back of a church. It's the same idea. You've got a little, a little hole 
uh, like the hole behind the uh, the pulpit in a typical Christian church. Uh, it's called the apse. We've got two little holes in the back of the skull of, of our reptilomorph or diapsid group. Okay? And so from the uh, from the fossil record, we can see these two lineages developing really clearly, starting with the Permian. And when we follow these lineages of, of amniotes out, we can see that the synapsids pretty much gives rise to the mammals and the mammals only. Whereas these diapsids, they diversify. They, we, we see a lot more variation. We're going we're gonna to be talking about all the different groups within the, uh, within the reptilomorph. So we've got all different kinds of reptiles, three lineages of things we typically identify as reptiles. This would be the turtles, the uh, lizards and snakes, as, as well as the crocodilia, and also the birds. Okay, so the uh, the more in interesting and diverse of these two lineages of amniotes is really the diapsida, although we tend to kind of um, have a special place in our hearts, the mammals. And so we will be developing that part of the story as well. Okay, I'm erasing this part of the tree right now, and I'm going to be putting in the times in the timeline. And now we're actually going to be moving into the Mesozoic, all the way through the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic. And so... Um, Cenozoic is over here, and we'll be putting in the Great Dying uh, right here. This is going to be the Permian-Triassic boundary. This is the Great Dying that occurs around 230 million years ago. And we've got three times of the Mesozoic. We'll have the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And remember, all these three times, all these three periods are part of the Mesozoic. Okay. ranging from about 230 million years ago to about 65.5 million years ago. Now when we follow the lineage of the synapses, as I said before, it's relatively, uh, it's relatively boring. So like from the earliest synapses that we find during the Carboniferous and Permian, we see diversification. We find a group that makes the transition from the Permian across that, that great dying period. And this is a group that we identify as the Therapsida. Okay. So synapses give rise to the Therapsids. I'll show you some pictures of all these things in a little bit. And the therapsids are the ones that make it across the Permian-Triassic boundary. And then by the time we get to the end of the Triassic, we've got the very first mammals. The mammal, most recent common ancestor, emerges from one of the many groups of the therapsids. So one of uh, the therapsids becomes this mammal, uh, most recent common ancestor. And fairly early on, we've got a couple of lineages, the monotremes, uh, are there. And then we, from this other branch, the theria, we see the splitting off of the marsupials. And then this other lineage, the uh, eutheria, is the one that is eventually going to go nuts. I mean, we see eutherians throughout the rest of the Mesozoic, but we don't get into placentals until after the uh, Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary. Most of the mammals that you're aware of, except for duck-billed platypuses, echidnas, and all the marsupials, all, all of these really took their, you know, the placentals took their uh, radiation after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, right? And so if we wanted to, to draw the, the modern forms of mammals, we'd see the monotremes, a very tiny, a, few, a small number of monotremes coming to the present, marsupials that make their way all the way to the present, and the placentals as well. So the diapsids during the Permian, they split into at least a couple of lineages that make it across the Permian-Triassic boundary. One of these guys is the Lepidosauria, Lepidosauromorphs, and, and this, is a, this is a lineage that gives rise to a couple of interesting characters that um, are there in the fossil record, like the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs. So if you want to have a mental image for, the, for an ichthyosaur, think of something that looks like a, a, like a dolphin, but it's actually an aquatic reptile. These are both ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs are forms that went back to the ocean. And so the ichthyosaur would look like this, and a plesiosaur was kind of like, uh, it's kind of like our prototypical image of what a uh, Loch Ness monster looks like. So. so have you seen the movies with some type of aquatic animal that swims around? It's really lousy. Um, Plesiosaur, but you get the idea. And ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs had their day in, in the in the sun um, or in the water, uh, but they eventually kind of die out. They, they they go extinct sometime before the end of the Cretaceous, right? Unless you believe in the Loch Ness monster, uh, there might be a relic population of plesiosaurs still living in a gigantic lake in Scotland. But apart from that, these lepidosaurs uh, went extinct. <laughs> 
the other group of lipidosaurs, another group of another lineage of lipidosaur splits, you know, fairly early on into two lineages, one of which is the squamata, okay, which are well known to us because this is our lizards and snakes group. I really should put uh, lizards first because lizards were around first and then the legless forms of snakes evolved later on. But lizards and snakes are still around. We see plenty of them. Um, the other group of lipidosaurs, which are also still around, are tuataras. If you want to see what a tuatara looks like, you'll have to Google that up. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll save you the time. It looks just like an iguana, but it's really not closely related to modern lizards and snakes at all. It's an ancient, ancient split away from the squamates before the squamates diversified. Okay? So tuatars are technically a fourth group of reptiles that we recognize, uh, which are so obscure we don't really pay too much attention to them. Okay? Now looking down here at the other group of diapsids, this is going to be the archosauria, which actually does some splitting up even before the Permian-Triassic boundary. There are some Permian turtles, for example, right? So there's some things from the Permian that look like turtles. That suggests that we have the origin of the anapsida, uh, so named because they, they've lost that hole at the back of their skull. The anapsids are the ones that give rise ultimately to the chelonia, which are the turtles and we see them all the way up to the present. I hope I've left myself enough room. Okay, so if we look at the modern organisms, we've got um, monotremes and marsupials and placentals. Those are three forms of modern vertebrates. The ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs had gone extinct. We see the squamates still existing to the present. The tuatars are still present and lots and lots of diversity within the chelonia. They're still around. Right. And so that's kind of like a lonely lineage of the archosaurs that seems to split off before the other three major group of arch archosaurs, which are as follows. One major group of archosaurs are the crocodilomorphs. Okay. I don't need to tell you what those are. You know, crocodiles, alligators, gharials, right? so caimans. And certainly they have had a long history of success all the way to the present. Neat thing about crocodiles is they really have undergone very, very little morphological evolution. Uh, since their inception. I mean, we've had some larger crocs and some smaller crocs, but they've pretty much always looked just like crocodiles. Okay. Another group of the archosaurs uh, that capture our fascination are the pterosauria. Things like pteranodon and pterodactyls. These are the great flying reptiles that ultimately go extinct. I don't remember exactly when they go extinct. It might be at the very end of the Cretaceous or it might be a little before that, but we don't have any living descendants of pterosaurs. Right. The other group of archosaurs that is uh, kind of important, and they're kind of contemporary, at least as far as their origin, is the, uh, is the dinosauria. And the dinosaur, most recent common ancestor, appears actually relatively you know, middle to late Triassic. And uh, within the dinosaurs, there are a couple of different uh, lineages, one of which is the Ornithischia, so named because these animals have bird-shaped uh, hips. Their, uh, their pubis goes in the same direction as their ischium. Okay, so the, the bones of the hip are usually three. You've got the ilium, you've got the ischium, and you've got the pubis, right? And so uh, three bones can be oriented. Usually the ilium is on top. The pubis and the ischium can be pointed either in opposite directions or they could be pointed in the same direction, right? So you could have them both pointed like that. And so the ornithischia and the saurischia, which is the other group, differ in the orientation of their hip bone. This is the traditional picture of dinosaur taxonomy. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a pretty substantial revision that's been proposed. Um, I'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. Now, the Ornithischia dinosaurs, they're all herbivores. And there, there are several different kinds of Ornithischians. There are four main groups, uh, some of which are that I think might be familiar to those of you who played with dinosaurs as kids, or you know, obviously not real dinosaurs, plastic dinosaurs. Uh, one group are the, is the ankylosaurs which are the super heavily armored uh, dinosaurs. And then you have the hadrosaurs. Those are the, like the duck-billed bipedal dinosaurs. The uh, ceratopsids is another group of ornithischians. Those are things like the, uh, the triceratops. And then also in this group is the stegosaurs, the ones with gigantic plates on their back and um, with plates that stick upwards. They also had spiky tails. So, so these ornithischians 
they all pretty much go extinct during the Mesozoic, right? or at least by the end of the Mesozoic. Now the Sauroschia is kind of neat because this is a group that has, well, two uh, really important groups, one of which is the Sauropodomorpha, which includes the largest land vertebrates ever to walk on the continents. These are things like the brontosaurs, like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus. And sauropods are obviously not around anymore, so they disappear by the end of the Cretaceous. Now the other group of saurischians, one that's still around today, are the theropods. And the theropods have, uh, have kind of like an interesting history. You've got some more basal theropods like the Allosaurus. Somewhat less basal organisms might be something like a T-Rex. And uh, another form that's even further out on the tree is like uh, Velociraptor. But the one group of theropod dinosaurs that's still around today is this group called the Aves. Yes, birds. Birds took their origin sometime in the Jurassic Cretaceous period. I didn't draw that perfectly to scale, but the Aves, birds, is another group of amniotes that's still around today. Okay, so we've got a fairly limited number of organisms that are still around today. These other, these other theropods, they all went extinct by the end of the Cretaceous. Allosaurs went extinct far before that. Larger predators like T-Rexes took their places. Velociraptors and other Manoraptorians were around much later into the Cretaceous. But after that great rock from outer space, the impact event, the meteoroid bolide impact of the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, there are many forms of Archosauria, as well as these, as well as these Ichthyosaurs and Plesiosaurs and Mosasaurs. Several of the reptilomorph lineages just completely went extinct, which really did set the table. It opened things up. It opened up a lot of niches for the diversification of placental mammals. Okay. You can actually thank that rock from outer space for making it possible for placentals to have the radiation. Okay, so now this is going to be a walkthrough of the uh, of a slideshow, the PowerPoint slideshow that you have on Canvas. Okay. Now, uh, what we're looking at here are the defining characteristics of chordates. Obviously, that's the title. Uh, but what we're looking at here is if, if you were to do like a cross section right through here, right? Uh, what you'd be able to find in the earliest period is the notochord. Uh, you would have the, the dorsal hollow nerve cord forming through that process of neurulation, as we described. Um, we've got pharyngeal slits. Okay, um, or pouches. In the case of a mammalian embryo, this is a human embryo, you can actually see that the slits don't go all the way through to the pharynx, but they do form in the right area. And they sometimes do go through. There, there are a small number of babies born, one out of every, I don't know how many thousand, that actually have complete canals that connect the outside world to their pharynx. Nowadays, these are typically uh, repaired, cosmetic surgery occurring after the baby is born. But uh, but yeah, it's it's just a reminder that this is kind of like a relic from our of our chordate past when there was a complete slit connecting the pharynx to the outside world. And the other thing that we actually have as embryos, maybe not as babies, is a muscular postnatal tail, right? And so uh, next slide would be uh, a picture of a uh, urochordate. Uh, this is the adult organism Siona. Uh, Siona is actually one of our favorite organisms to use for developmental studies because of its closeness to the rest of the chordates. It's, uh, some, and and it's, also, it's also completely transparent. We can see things going on inside of this tunicate because its body is completely transparent. Uh, for the uh, larval seona that we have on the upper left hand side, what we have is an in situ hybridization of the genes that are associated with notochords. And we can see that the notochord gene activity is there in this urochord that we find along the, along the tail the larval version of the animal we have in the lower right. Okay, so these are both Siona adult, baby. Certainly it looks like a chordate up here, even though it doesn't look like a chordate down below. Next slide. As I pointed out earlier, in vertebrates, we really don't have any uh, need for a notochord later in development because we've got a vertebral column to offer the same type of support and flexibility that we have in uh, the ancestral notochord. The notochordial cells, however, are not completely eliminated. I mean, that, that would be one cell fate. Uh, if you have a population of embryonic cells that's no longer functional, uh, there could be a cellular death. It could be a programmed cellular destruction, uh, apoptosis. Uh, but in some cases, those cells get repurposed for other fates uh, later on in development of the animal. And, and in our case, as vertebrates, we have uh, intervertebral discs forming 
to serve as cushions between the actual vertebral centra. And the inner gushy parts of these intervertebral discs called the nucleus pulposus are apparently derived from the notochordial cells in early embryonic development. This is a picture of a hagfish. Now in the earlier edition of Campbell, there was a more basal node below that of the vertebrata. It was called the craniata. At the time, people thought that uh, hagfishes were actually more distantly related to the rest of the vertebrates compared to things that actually had vertebrae. Now, technically, hagfish don't have vertebrae, at least anything that's evident as vertebrae in their adult uh, body form. They don't have notochords either. They basically tie their whole bodies in knots. They're extremely flexible. Uh, their, their body plan actually really is flimsy and floppy, just like an earthworm. Um, but as it turns out, we now see that hagfishes are really, truly more closely related to uh, lampreys. Uh, lampreys are the other group of, uh, of vertebrates that don't have any jaws that are still alive today. So lampreys and hagfish really do represent their own little grouping. Okay, um, Their ecologies couldn't be more different. Uh, lampreys are kind of like predators and will attach to the, uh, these larger fishes and eat them while they're still alive, whereas the hagfish are scavengers that live on the bottom of the ocean typically. So uh, hagfishes and lampreys are modern representatives of the ancient jawless fishes. Now as we move into the nathostomes, the picture at the bottom here depicts the placoderm, the kind of nathostome that we no longer have today. It went extinct uh, during the Paleozoic. Now the top of the slide refers to that uh, event of homeosis that presumably gave rise to the earliest chawed vertebrates. The skeletal element supporting the gill arch uh, move forward and actually becomes the jaw, the lower jaw, in the earliest jawed vertebrates, the nathostomes. Okay. Okay, the next slide, we see the kind of endochondral or true bone that apparently is lacking in things like placoderms, things like the ancient armored jawless fishes. They had bony plates on the outside or plate-like structures internally, uh, which allowed them to do things like forming a cranium. Uh, but they didn't have the long bone. They didn't have the kind of bone that would be good for supporting body mass. And so true bone was the innovation that really did allow vertebrates to make the transition onto dry land. And so this is a neat image. It's actually a live coelacanth, the Latimeria coelacanth that lives at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. And so this is kind of rare. I mean, we, we'd seen coelacanth carcasses that were dredged up from the bottom. This is one that was taken in the actual habitat. Now the other kind of sarcopterygian fish-like organism is the uh, lungfish. And uh, this is an Australian lungfish that was captured by this lucky angler. And, uh, and yeah, there are actually two forms of sarcopterygian in this photo. Can you see them? Now this slide is obviously not taken in the Devonian, but it reminds us of what the climate must have been like during the Devonian. This is an image of the Pantanal, which is an area uh, extending through much of, of uh, the southern portion of Brazil. Bolivia, Paraguay, uh, and this uh, this is a, a gigantic pantana. It's a floodland. It gets a lot of rain during the rainy season, and it dries out during the wet season. And if you go to and, and if you visit this habitat, uh, it's really a great place for spotting wildlife today because yeah, it is extremely productive. There's a lot of food that becomes available during the flooded part of the year, and uh, and you'll find lots of fishes. You'll find lots of birds, crocodiles. There are lots of things that take advantage of that bounty during the flooded period. And during the dry season, what you see is a, a huge congregation of other kinds of predators that are taking advantage of all of the fishes that are stuck in these drying ponds. It's really a great place to go to go wildlife spotting. Now in the Devonian, we didn't have all of those terrestrial predators. So it was a little bit different, but basically the idea here is that we've got an extremely productive area. And so this would have been the cradle of terrestrial vertebrates. Some of these early vertebrates would, would have been things like the ichthyostega, the thing that we have in the left-hand image, and then we've got Tiktaalik, kind of a famous fossil uh, described by Neil Shubin of the University of Chicago, yay, uh, discovered in Greenland, which during the Devonian would have been mid-continent and subtropical. In other words, in exactly the same type of habitat that I showed you a picture of in the previous slide. And this slide reminds us that amphibians modern tetrapods that are not amniotes, they do return to the water to spawn. 
and presumably this would have been the ancestral state for all of the tetrapods and it was only the amniotes that during the Carboniferous figured out a way to have their entire development their entire life take place without ever having to go back to their aquatic origins all right and so this is the amniotic egg and it's the major innovation of that lineage for which we have two different forms remember we've got the synapsids and the diapsids okay and looking first at the diapsids these are both lipidosaurs okay um, on the top one is the mosasaurus which is a gigantic aquatic uh, lipidosaur uh, it's neither a plesiosaur nor an ichthyosaur i didn't tell you about all the different kinds of lipidosauria but mosasaurs were also large aquatic lipidosaurs they basically were terrestrial but they went back to the seas presumably because they liked seafood okay um, so that's one lipidosaur on the lower right we've got a modern lipidosaur this would be a squamate a komodo dragon and one thing you could see is that in both of these animals you've got two post-orbital fenestri okay so here is the location of the ocular orbit and we've got one and two post-orbital fenestri for both the um, the Komodo dragon as well as the mosasaur uh, the most basal of the archosaurs are the anapsids if you look at the skull it's, I know you can't see it very well but there is no hole in the skull besides the ocular orbit these are anapsid organisms and they're presumably a derived state from the diapsid lineage Okay. Um, in modern turtles, we've got two different forms. We've got the cryptodeers. Uh, cryptodeers are the ones that are able to pull their necks back into their shells. They can pull their heads back to their shells by creating this S-shaped arch in the uh, in their neck vertebrae. Um, on the right hand side we've got the pleurodeers or the side neck turtles and when threatened these turtles don't pull their necks back under their shells they basically have a little groove on the side of their shells on the side of the carapaces to allow them to uh, protect their heads okay. uh, mata mata turtles don't do this but they're also part of the pleurodera okay so in the main archosauria branch we've got crocodilomorpha and, and crocodilians as I said before they've pretty much always looked like crocodiles if you saw this guy walking down the street today you would say hey that's a crocodile but this is a fossil of Isis fordia which is the earliest known crocodilomorph in other words they really haven't changed at all since the earliest days of their evolution I think that's kind of neat there are some other organisms that do the same thing uh, sharks have changed very little uh, since the earliest sharks there hasn't been that much morphological evolution which might suggest that there are some morphologies that are either very constrained maybe they can't evolve or maybe they're just already as good as they can be from the very earliest days in which they take their form uh, another branch of the archosauria or the pterosaurs including pterodactylus are substantively sized these are fairly large animals uh, flying reptiles and uh, for those of you who don't know this these are not birds at all they're not even closely related to birds birds are dinosaurs these are not dinosaurs this is a pterosaur okay and here are the four kinds of ornithischians that I mentioned in the earlier part of this video you know, down in the lower left that's the ankylosaur upper right is the hadrosaur the duck-billed dinosaurs um, in the lower right that's a stegosaur and in the upper left that's the ceratopsid all of these guys are herbivores they share the characteristic of having their pubis pointing backwards you can see that here and the general logic underlying the reason why the pubis was pointing backwards in these dinosaurs was that they're herbivores and uh, because they're herbivores they had to have had a fairly large digestive surface area they would have had pretty large pot bellies and uh, and having the pubis pointing backwards would have allowed for more space in the abdominal cavity the other group of the dinosaurs the Saurischia include things like the sauropodomorpha the sauropods is an apatosaurus one of the biggest animals that have ever walked on the planet we've got the allosaurs this is one of the earlier theropod dinosaurs if you if you you can't really see it here but the pubis in this one is pointing forwards and that is consistent with the idea that uh, this being a meat-eating dinosaur would not have needed to have nearly as much digestive space in the abdominal portion of the body cavity and the pubis pointing forward is basically a possibility okay uh, lower right this is Archaeopteryx this is a dinosaur that's basically the sister taxon to modern birds modern birds being represented by our chicken that we have in the lower left 
right? So there are the uh, there are the dinosaurs. Now moving over to the synapsid lineage, we've got animals like this. This is Dimetrodon. Maybe some of you might even recognize this from your childhood if you were ever playing with little plastic dinosaurs. There might have been a Dimetrodon in the kit. Well, newsflash, this is not a dinosaur at all. It's, it's not even in the right time period. Uh, Dimetrodon are Permian animals. They, they predate the earliest dinosaurs by several million years, by several hundred million years. Right? Not only that, they're also in the wrong group of amniotes. Uh, they're synapsids. They're actually on the, on the same lineage that gives rise to you and me. And you can tell that because these Permian reptiles have only one hole, one post-orbital fenestra in their skulls, clearly seen here. Okay. Now, dimetrodons are part of the pelicosauria, which are, which are some synapsids uh, that are actually pretty successful. He had some pelicosaurs that were herbivorous, some like the dimetrodon were carnivorous. By the time we get across that Permian-Triassic boundary, the pelicosaurs like, uh, like dimetrodon were gone, and we had more elaborate, fancier synapsids. And the most notable of these synapsids are called the therapsida, which basically means they've got beast-like faces. Right? And their beastliness is uh, partly due to their specialized dentition. I mean, when you look at the face of these guys, you see these large canines, both in the lower and upper jaw, and that makes them look pretty scary and beastly. At least that's the way I interpret this. Now, these therapsids are, are very much intermediate forms. They've got a lot of mammalian characteristics. I mean, you know, this is a reconstruction of Synognathus, a fairly large therapsid of the Triassic. Now, we're not sure that Synognathus actually had fur like this artist's depiction shows. We certainly don't know if it had stripes. Now, the fur might not be that bad of an idea, because we can tell by looking at the rostral area of the skull on the left that there were little pores that probably that probably uh, accommodated the sensory hairs, uh, like what you have in modern dogs, right? Uh, that, you know, if you look at a modern dog's rostral skeleton, there are little pores that correspond to the location of the hairs that allow animals, that allow mammals, to, the whiskers, right? That allow these animals to, uh, to sense vibrations. And so if these pores had similar functions in, the, in animals like Syndignathus, then Sygnathus would probably have had sensory hairs, certainly. So these sensory hairs on, this, on the face of the Sygnathus is probably pretty well justified. And, you know, if they had sensory hairs, they might as well have had other hairs covering the body, right? There are other bits of evidence that might support the ideas that these guys are endothermic. And if they're endothermic, it would make sense for them to have had some type of insulating body covering like fur. Now, the Cynodontia is that group of therapsids that includes the animals that gave rise to mammals. So this is the group that had the most mammal-like characteristics. Now when we look at therapsids and their, and their changes from the earliest things like the synapsid that we have on top to a more specialized cynodont like the one we have on the bottom, we can see that the teeth are becoming more specialized and we also see that there's a change in the morphology of the lower jaw. Now in modern mammals there's only one bone in the lower jaw, that's the dentary. Right? Uh, the dentary is, it's called the dentary because it's the one that supports the teeth. In these earlier therapsids and synapsids, we see two other bones, the surangular and the angular, being parts of the lower jaw. Now, both the surangular and the angular disappear in mammalian evolution. Uh, what we're left with at the end of mammalian evolution is just, just the dentary. In the dentary, this upper process eventually forms a new articulation with the skull. And the surangular and the angular, they don't actually disappear. They become parts of the, of the bones of the middle ear, right? So the, the tiniest bones in your body are the stirrup, the anvil, and the hammer. And these are the ones that assist in the transduction of vibrations in the middle ear so that you can pick up, you can, you can hear things. Those bones of the middle ear, they're kind of taking shape from little floating bits of flotsam and jetsam, the, the surangular and angular were little kind of floating bones after the dentary forms this new articulation with the, with the skull. And one of the neatest things that we see in these therapsid skulls is a period of time in which animals actually had two different articulations. So it was like one rear articulation, that's the old one, that involved the, uh, an upper process from the surangular and angular joint. Okay? Uh, and then a second articulation from, the, uh, from that process that's coming upwards in the dentary, that becomes the second articulation. So these therapsids could actually open their mouth big, they could open their mouth kind of small, 
and these transitional therapsids give us that uh, that perfect transitional state between having the old articulation of the synapsida and the new articulation that's characterized by the uh, by the mammals. Now, while it might be nice for us to envision our ancient relatives, our ancient pre-mammalian relatives, this including that gigantic synognathus that I showed you before, uh, more likely the lineage of cynodont therapsids that gave rise to the mammals were things that were on the smaller order. Okay, uh, one reason for this, and we'll get to this really soon, it's kind of like our, our first physiology lecture, is that it would have been the smallest of the therapsids that so would have had the greatest need for endothermy. And these smaller therapsids would not only have been more likely endothermic because of their small body size, but they would also have been more likely endothermic because they would have been nocturnal, taking advantage of the absence of day-active dinosaurs. And so the earliest mammals, like this hadrocodium, are showing up in the fossil record, you know, roughly Triassic-y, uh, around the same time as the earliest dinosaurs. Um, but they don't really undergo their diversification, and the dinosaurs hit their A game right away. Uh, they diversified into the Saurischia and the Ornithischia. They, uh, they took over. They, they were definitely the dominant landforms of life during the Mesozoic. Mammals were pretty much missing in action. Maybe not missing in action, but they, you know, they're not completely missing in action. Uh, but we don't see that many fossils of them. They're, they're not very abundant until after the cretaceous paleogene boundary. We definitely see the fossils. We see various kinds of mammals, mammals that don't exist anymore, mammals that are easily recognizable as marsupials or things that might be eutherians. But according to our latest interpretations, placental mammals really don't start taking shape until after the start of the Cenozoic.